And so while witchcraft and goddess worship are a major conduit for the demonic energies that swirl in and through the abortion movement, there is another, more masculine component as well. Good old fashioned, do what thou wilt, Satanism. And back to Crowley. Aldous Huxley famously dined with him and it was rumored that the old beast took the opportunity to turn him on to peyote. Not only did the famed author of Brave New World later romanticize the emerging drug culture by writing Doors of Perception, he also wrote the preface to Birth Control Methods by Australian sexologist and closet homosexual Norman Hare. A colleague of Ellis Ann Hirschfield's and an attendee of the World Sex Congress in 1921, Hare, like the others, was a staunch supporter of gay rights and the eugenics movement. But even more interesting and significant is Crowley's connection to perhaps the 20th century's most influential sexologist, Alfred Kinsey. Founder of the Institute for Research in Sex, Gender, and Reproduction at Indiana University, now called the Kinsey Institute, Kinsey, like his European counterparts, set out to normalize all manner of deviant sexuality under the guise of objective science. Bisexual and with a penchant for masochism, Kinsey encouraged group sex among his graduate students and filmed sex acts in the attic of his home under the guise of research. Toward the end of his life, Kinsey, along with avant-garde filmmaker and Crowley disciple Kenneth Anger, visited the great beast at his lair at the Thelema Abbey in Sicily. Anger later observed, Kinsey was obsessed with obtaining the great beast's day-to-day -day sex diaries. To obtain grant monies and maintain the support of the university, Kinsey needed the excuse of research to validate his 24 hours a day obsession with sex. That the man who perhaps more than any other was responsible for the quote, legitimization of sexual perversion in the latter half of the 20th century was both a pervert and a fan of the century's most notable occultist is a fact that should be shouted from the housetops, as well as his connection to the abortion industry. In April of 1955, 16 months before he died, Kinsey attended a clandestine conference on the abortion issue at the Arden House in Harriman, New York. Sponsored by Planned Parenthood and the New York Academy of Medicine, a report from the conference was published three years later. Edited by Planned Parenthood's president, Dr. Mary Calderon, abortion in the United States was the first serious apologetic on abortion rights. Kinsey was quoted as the leading scientific authority at the conference, citing data from his questionable research suggesting that illegal abortions were very common and dangerous, while therapeutic abortion, abortion performed by a doctor, posed minimal health risks. In other words, legalizing abortion made perfect medical sense. Pregnancy, Birth, and Abortion published the same year by three Kinsey Institute researchers and dedicated to Kinsey, made essentially the same argument. Together, these books were a first major strike against America's abortion laws and provided the so-called scientific support for the prestigious American Law Institute's position on abortion. Codified in their 1959 draft of the model penal code, the proposed law allowed for elective abortions in case of rape, incest, fetal deformity, and threats to the mother's physical or mental health. Regarding rape and incest, some people make an exception for that, but if we really believe that a human life begins at the moment of conception, then how can we say that someone who was conceived by virtue of somebody else's sin is less worthy of life than somebody who is conceived in any other way? It's not the child's fault with regards to rape and incest. And we don't undo one tragedy by compounding it with a greater tragedy. Death never overcomes adversity. Life always triumphs. From a personal perspective as well, my own family has experienced both rape and incest where my father raped my sister. And it's obviously a tragic experience for anyone, certainly when it happens in a family member or when it happens to anybody. But rather than choose death, she chose life. And as a result, my niece was born and my niece 
grew up and she was married and she gave birth to another daughter and both of them have now graduated from high school. So I have two generations that have come from a tragedy. I could never look at my nieces and say that it would be better for you to have been killed for something that you didn't do. And neither would my sister ever reconsider that decision to choose life. When you choose life, that's always the right choice. Well, most people think of Roe v. Wade because that was the first decision. But there was a companion decision that followed right up after it, again in 1973. Roe v. Wade said that the state of Texas could not limit a woman's right to have an abortion because of privacy under the 14th Amendment. But Roe v. Wade, in their attempt, the judge's attempt to be a little more reasonable, put a limit. You couldn't kill a child after that child was viable. Along came Doe v. Bolton. And most people have never heard of Doe v. Bolton, and they are under the illusion that you can't kill a child when it is viable. You can kill a child up to nine months, a minute before that child would be naturally born. And that's what Doe v. Bolton did. It took away all the little safeguards that Roe v. Wade had, their companion decisions. And it listed as the way that you would judge whether you could kill this child, the life and the health of the mother. And under the health, they included all sorts of things like emotional, physical health, but emotional, financial, educational. In other words, they just opened the floodgates. It is perfectly legal in all 50 states of the United States because this is a Supreme Court decision to kill a child right up until the moment that that child would normally be born. This last stipulation, mental health of course, was the camel's nose in the tent that made abortion as a fallback method of birth control possible. All a woman had to do to get an abortion was to say that having the unplanned baby would impinge on her happiness or peace of mind. The door to abortion on demand was now open. New York was among the first states to walk through it and by 1970 had the most liberal abortion laws in the country. The Supreme Court forced the rest of the United States to follow in 1973, citing the ALI's model penal code in its infamous Roe v. Wade decision. Do what thou wilt became the whole of the law.